So, hello to everybody. If uh, people are here already, that would be great. Um, so, just a few thoughts on uh, what's been going on in the world of cello playing and music in general through this difficult time of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, uh, over a year ago, uh, since March 2020, most orchestras and pretty much the whole music scene has been shut down and, as you know, has been slowly, gradually coming back to some kind of normalcy. Um, and taking a lot of time away from being on stage, from a busy concert schedule uh, with Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, uh, you know, I think it made us all think of things that are important to us, not only uh, cello per se, cello playing, but um, also of everything that happens in one's life uh, regarding to how we come about playing the instrument. And uh, before I talk about anything like that, I just want to say that for us being a successful instrumentalist, uh, it really takes you know, a whole bunch of people to support us, to love us, to make us practice when we need to. And uh, I think it always starts with the family. And so I'm extremely grateful to have my parents who are still alive, who've always supported and pushed me through and helped me with everything. And my older brother, who is a double bass player, he's a principal bass of uh, North Carolina Symphony, who's also been extremely supportive and taught me a lot. And, and all the people that I've met on the way, including all of my teachers uh, that I've had in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, and then coming to America, uh, Tatiana Romenikova at the University of Minnesota, and then uh, the, the teacher that I think that really made an extremely uh, strong impact in my life was Harvey Shapiro, who I studied with at the Juilliard School for six years. But then after graduating, I continued study with him probably for another 10 years, uh, taking lessons and you know, he's been extremely supportive and also tough and honest and helpful and pretty much everything that one can uh, wish for a teacher to be. Um, but it's not just the people that are directly affecting your total plane, but also the people that you meet, which are your colleagues and your loved ones, and perhaps it's the conductors and the music directors and soloist and everybody who has shaped uh, one's view of music and how to practice correctly. Like for instance, Yo-Yo Ma has been an incredible influence. Uh, seeing him over the years coming uh, as a soloist to play with different orchestras, um, you know, seeing him every time has been incredible. Uh, I think the Hello, hi from Mexico, Juan, Mr. Reyes from Mexico, hello. And then there's a question from Michael Fisher. Can you recall a specific piece of advice from any of your teachers and musicians you have worked with that has proved to be particularly impactful throughout your career? Hi, Brent. Uh, you know, specific piece of advice, I, I've gotten a lot of them and uh, a lot of them been phenomenal. One of the advices from my teacher from Harvey Shapiro has been uh, that you ha really have to be honest and uh, probably be most, the biggest critic of oneself. Um, when you listen to your practice, uh, you cannot let yourself go on if there's something that you do that you don't like or doesn't sound great. Um, I've also 
have seen many people being extremely critical to oneself and in doing so they've been really you know almost downgrading themselves and there's a great piece of advice from uh, Gregor Piatigorsky who said not only do you have to know what you are not doing so well but you also have to know what you do really well and then bring everything up else uh, up to that uh, standard but it is very important to know what you do well what it is that you like about your playing what it is that you like about playing a particular um, you know piece of music or uh, or a particular phrase you know what it is that made it great so you can first of all repeat it and second of all definitely um feel good about your playing because i've seen and met many people who are uh you know so critical that i it feels like when they play um on stage they don't really enjoy it you know they're so afraid to make a mistake uh or to make it sound in a way that they may not particularly like but you know um, we don't get that many chances to repeat things, you know. So, for instance, one of the greatest lessons I had was when yo Ma came to Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra several years ago, and he was playing Borgia Concerto with us. And so I came in to the hall a little earlier to say hello. And he kind of invited me in and said, I have to play Borgia for... Maestro Langray, could you come in and listen? And so I was kind of like a, you know, a little bog on the wall. Was able to see the run through. But what was interesting is that yo, -Yo Ma kept on interrupting himself and turning to me and said, well, but here I do this kind of fingering. If the bassoon does this, or if the orchestra does this, I do this kind of bowing. So, or if the hole sounds dry, I do these kind of bowings or if the hall indeed is very kind of wet and boomy, this is what I do to create more articulation. And it was incredible. But, you know, the reason he knew all of that is because he's played that concerto many, many hundreds of times, perhaps thousands of times to know this what works and this what doesn't. And I think very often we're in a position where we play something just once. Uh, and we want everything to work and it's great if it does but sometimes it doesn't and you know so perhaps there's something to do later on there's a question from santa anna hello santa um tell us what you love most about your cello how is it different from others you have played uh all right so um this particular instrument is a Dominica Montagnano made in 1730. And it's probably the only instrument that I know that does not have any kind of limitations as to what it can do uh, from the colors of it to the volume to the dynamic range. Um, this is really the first time where you know, anything that one is asking from it, it can do. It just all the limitations are on me, you know, on uh, as a player. But otherwise, this particular cello is, I don't know, simply sensational. I am more than lucky to be able to play it and spend time with it every day and to learn from it. It is remarkable. And besides, it's a piece of art and uh, it's beautiful and it's just fantastic. You know, it's a, an inspiration of truly of everyday inspiration that is next to me. So very lucky indeed. And, you know, I've played many wonderful instruments, tried them and played them. Uh, every one of them has a particular character and sometimes it's a beautiful flaw that instrument has you know a lot of people don't like having a wolf and 
a wolf node, you know, it's the one that kind of fights. Uh, strangely enough, I love having it because I think it gives a whole instrument more resonance. So I've, over the years, I've been learning how to deal with it while having it as well. So there's another question from Mr. Mesker. Um, in what ways does playing professionally in a professional orchestra affect the way you play and practice individually? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, besides just learning the orchestra repertoire, which is vast, it's probably the vastest repertoire that as an instrumentalist one might have, and it really you know, um, it includes smaller pieces for smaller orchestra to a huge 150 member orchestra uh, playing cello ensembles. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know anywhere else where one can have that kind of vastness in the repertoire. So we have to really be able to do pretty much everything jacks of all trades you know and uh, our orchestra also does a lot of pops and, and so we need to know the different styles of music how to play uh, together well and pretty much uh, immediately you know so i think being a little bit more disciplined about rhythm about intonation so things that are fairly basic that everybody kind of often takes for granted, we have to do it, you know, with 10 other people or with 100 other people. So in order for everybody to play together instantaneously, you really have to be very disciplined in uh, executing what it is on the page, whether it's the uh, rhythm uh, or dynamic. So that becomes very important. And as I now I've been playing in the orchestra for the past, uh, let's see, 24 years. Uh, it kind of goes on to uh, working on the solo cello repertoire, you know, whether it's a concerto or what, just to make sure that you still keep the integrity of the rhythms and the integrity of the dynamic and uh, really think about what the composer asks for, because I think that's where everything starts is what the composer uh, puts in the music and how we can interpret it in the most honest and true way. A question from Julie Escher. How do you provide a better foundation to your orchestral sound as a cellist? I will struggle with balance, when to play more or less. Any advice? Um, I think one of the more interesting things about playing in the orchestra is not really to play less, but, uh, or, or more, I think it's about having the same ideas as the entire section. So the dynamic range, but also it's about the quality of a sound. I think that's even more important than uh, whether to play less or more, because the sound that really sticks out whether you play less or more is not going to add to the section, you know, so I'm always looking for a full, beautiful sound, which is always important, you know, whether it's soft or, or loud and the type of vibrato that it does not make the sound too narrow and kind of laser like, you know. Okay. Uh, the question from John Casti, how to balance preparing so much orchestra repertoire with your busy performance schedule? Huh. I try my best, <laughs> really. Um, and, you know, as you play in the orchestra more and more and more, you kind of, I guess, figure out the uh, certain patterns, a lot of repertoire repeats. So, you know, since, you know, kind of whole repertoire overall probably takes anywhere from five to nine years to repeat, you know, 
Brahms symphonies, Beethoven symphonies, Mahler, Bruckner symphonies, Schubert symphonies, they all kind of uh, um, repeat. And so as you get to know them, you sometimes don't need to learn them completely anew. You know, you, you just remember what it is and then every conductor brings something new. So uh, you just have a little bit more time perhaps to play, uh, to practice solo, but basically, yeah, the time is always limited. And so you have to be very mindful as to how much time you spend and how thoughtful you are about practicing. Question from Susan Peterson. Hi. Um, can you speak about how to go about executing a perfect shift? Perfect shift is a fabulous thing uh, to execute. I don't know if, if it ever happens to be perfect, but so I think one can think about what the shift is for. Is it just simply to go from one position to another, or is that a more of a vocal sliding uh, technique that you really accentuate uh, the interval or perhaps the emotional um, content of that particular interval, of that particular uh, shift, right? So what I learned from Joseph Silverstein is that he always said that the left hand always has the same speed of a shift. And it's the bow arm that is going to accentuate it, make it sound more or less, um, or hide it, or really make it come to the, the front or make a highlight out of it. And so what, what um, having the same speed of a shift does, whatever the shift is, it doesn't matter whether it's high, uh, you know, far away or is it a, a second one, you know, just to a next note, that constant speed gives one consistency. Uh, so we just have to make sure that we have enough bow left for the shift. And usually what I've noticed from teaching um, and playing that it's when we don't have enough bow, the left hand starts to go super quickly. And that's when we run into issues. Uh, Hannah Orlando, thank you for sharing last time. Uh, Don Juan is one of the toughest excerpts. Do you have any advice to achieve precision and musicality? Well, um, I think, let's say, given all the fact, things that we have to do well, right? So to play in tune, to execute everything that it is on the page. So, uh, um, you know, different articulations, dynamic uh, rhythms, those all have to be done. Uh, correctly in order to play for everybody to play together. Um, what I often notice that people uh, kind of forget that it is a, a most beautiful piece. And I remember here in Philadelphia Orchestra playing the opening and it sounded so beautiful and remarkable that I cannot even imagine wanting to play it in any other way, whether it is single notes or rapid notes in succession or pizzicatos, which I think very often uh, are overlooked. You know, a lot of people play. They execute them so harshly, uh, but uh, it is also part of music. And so to make sure to have a great ringing pizzicatos, it's a, it's a, a little thing, but you know, it, it makes a tremendous difference. Um, so the content of what you're playing, I think, will make you think of the sound and finding that character in the sound will make it sound more musical. Hello from Bolivia, from Miguel Angel Salazar. Um, which warm up, warm up exercises would you recommend for every day? You know, that all depends on how much time you have. So um, very often 
because we have rehearsals and I teach and, you know, we don't have all that much exercises, uh, all that much time to warm up. So I just do few things, you know, first of all, sometimes I see people stretch a lot before they play. And I think you have to be fairly careful with that because if your muscles are cold and you stretch and doing something too much, you, know, you can really damage yourself. So I would like it more if, you know, even doing jumping jacks, make the blood flow and make it warms up the muscles. One of the exercises that my teacher used to say that you have to do is basically uh, how to find the first position, you know, how to find first finger on every string. Once we find that and we find that note, it usually has an open string, an octave higher, you know, so a D. When you see it starts to ring, you know, you're headed in tune. And then once you can just put your hand on the first note, then I think you know exactly where you are. As you do that, you can add one extra note. by little uh, you'll become more aware of where you are in space because I think every time and very often you know we come to a, another room the chair is slightly different and maybe the end pin is a little bit shorter or, or longer I think that really helps establish uh, intonation and where you are in space on the cello and around the cello all right uh, okay, so question from uh, Jordan Anderson. How do you approach Haydn D differently than Dvorak or Schumann in an audition setting? Uh, very good question. And very often those two concertos, Dvorak and Schumann, you know, they're both romantic, although one is a little, you know, Dvorak was written later. Uh, but, and Haydn is very often asked, and the reason for it is because Besides being extremely difficult and crystal clear, which basically brings out <laughs> everything that one can do or cannot do, there is definitely a difference between playing a classical piece uh, and a romantic piece. So what does it have to do with? Well, I think partially it's the use of vibrato. So if, if a Schumann, sometimes you can give a little more, that kind of vibrato is not going to really work and heighten it will, from, from my taste, sounds a little too much, you know? Then it really is no different. So I would always recommend looking for a clearer tone. So I'm looking for a core in the sound and also extremely clear articulation in the heighten. So I often hear... You know, and actually there are beautiful slurs and especially as the notes get repeated. I think it's very important to clarify it and as throughout the concerto. Uh, what is your process when practicing for an orchestra rehearsal, especially for new contemporary pieces? It's a question from Elaine McDaniel. So uh, new contemporary pieces, it's a very, uh, very interesting and important question because uh, in Cincinnati, we're playing a lot of uh, modern music and we contemporary music and we think that is very important indeed to, uh, to play that because that's the only way, you know, Beethoven was contemporary at one point, so was Mozart and everybody else. Um, so we do, you know, a lot of commissions and we play a lot of music. So how, uh, how do we practice it? So usually the composer has a fairly clear markings as to the tempo, articulation. And um, so we can somewhat prepare the piece. Very often the piece has not been ever played, so you cannot find a recording to know what it's gonna sound like. So you can often, in our case, we can all often look at the score and just to figure out what sounds where, if there are big uh, 
gaps when we don't play make sure you put in certain cues just to know where you are uh, i think counting is very important and actually i would very much recommend when you practice practice counting rests as well as counting when you play because um, very often i know people get a little bit uh you know thrown off uh, by what happens in the modern pieces um, we're lucky if a com composer actually shows up you know and then you can ask him questions and they will make it more clearly but uh, you know they would make it clear for to understand what they want uh, but just to start you know just the basic tempos uh, sometimes I put in fingerings I usually don't like to but if it is something very difficult or there's some weird unusual patterns I certainly do that so I can quickly get to where I need to go uh, Jeremy Klein, could you give us any thoughts on how we can adapt fast to different conditions and sizes of concert halls, rooms, especially in an audition setting? Since we're playing mostly in our living room these days, I feel like I've lost a feeling for bigger rooms lately. Um, it's a fantastic question. Um, with the pandemic, you know, uh, because we did not have a chance to go out and we basically stay in our rooms and some rooms are smaller than others we're starting to get used to that sound uh teaching also over zoom sometimes it's hard to figure out what the sound is so it's been a very difficult time i noticed that for myself and and others we we really do start to lose uh, the feeling for how to play in a larger space so but in, or, in order to answer that we need to figure out what it is to play in a bigger room right um, just remember especially in the audition setting that you're not a trombone you're never going to play louder than those big instruments so don't try to force the sound just because you think you need to fill a bigger space i don't think that works uh, because the sound gets squashed and actually the sound is not any bigger it just gets harsher so i would think that the quality of the sound that you create at home um, should really work in a larger space so as a matter of fact i think the larger the space, the less force you need. Um, I would recommend trying to practice playing closer to the bridge without forcing at all. So find the bow speed, find the pressure uh, to make sure that you get the sound that is full, but without crack or without harshness. Um, yeah, and I would record oneself. So since now we have a lot of recording devices on, whether it's on the phones or, you know, or Zooms and, you know, little recording things, try to record yourself for the mic being close up and then record yourself from further away just to see what it is you do. I do a lot of, when I practice at home, I really try to imagine that I'm in a larger space. So. It's, it's harder sometimes to feel that when you're surrounded by walls. Uh, but imagine what it's like to play in the hole. So really use your imagination and, you know, instead of playing for the microphone, you know, try to play with a sound that, that really is going to go, but without ever squashing it down. Okay. Uh, question from Lee Peters. How much involvement do you have with regards to the programming of the season repertoire with the Cincinnati Symphony? Um, probably a little bit. Probably not all that much. Um, we have an artistic advisory committee and uh, we're always eager to tell them 
if there are any pieces or solos that we'd love to have, you know, but really coming up with a repertoire and, and making up a season is like a, it's a puzzle, you know, and especially after all these times um, that season's been canceled. So traveling is a little more difficult. Um, so it's very difficult to figure out how to get everything in with everything that we do. And we do contemporary music and we do music of, uh, you know, contemporary composers. And we have a series of rules. We do music of African-American composers and we'll play for specific audiences and we play pops and we play ballet and we played opera. So there's a lot that goes on into programming. And so sometimes they listen to us and sometimes they have other ideas, but usually we have good seasons. And uh, Mary, Mary Gardner, could you please share more about what it was like to work with Joseph Silverstein? Yeah, with pleasure. Uh, I got a chance to play with Mr. Silverstein some chamber music up in Maine. He had a, a chamber music series in Camden and Rockport, Maine, and that was called uh, Old Stars. Uh, it's a little flashy name, but he basically, uh, Mr. Silverstein, he would invite principals of major orchestras and would play chamber music. And so uh, I did it for several years and Every time playing with him was truly amazing in a way that he knew exactly how to make things work. And he didn't have to say a lot. He just say, oh, well, just hold this note a little longer. And all of a sudden, all the corners and all the phrases would just make sense and they would just come together. And just seeing him play and make music with such ease that uh, he would do it, it was so inspirational plus you know i can only imagine if i would see him in mask <laughs> now you know we could probably read more looking at his eyebrows going up and down they were very very expressive but uh, he was i don't know an idol if one can have an idol that was one of them you know just the way he was holding the violin and making a sound and the ease of playing and the knowledge of the repertoire chamber music repertoire and the violin repertoire and he was a wonderful conductor so he knew everything from many different perspectives and so it was truly truly inspirational uh caitlin chanel hi caitlin has your golf game influenced any of your ideas or thoughts about cello so yes without a doubt Golf has influenced a lot. I've learned a lot from my golf coaches as to how the body works, uh, all the biomechanics of the swing, and we can really transfer a lot of things into playing. And I'm sure Caitlin heard me play, uh, talk about it quite often. Uh, but basically, in golf, you have to have your uh, basics in order in order to make or to have a chance to make a proper swing and hit the ball where you think it should go. Playing the cello is basically the same. You have to make sure that you're sitting properly, holding the bow properly. And by properly, I mean athletically. So everyone is different. Everybody has different heights, different widths, different length of the arms. And so it will look slightly differently. But the idea is always the same. We need to make sure that we engage our core, we need to make sure that we're slightly forward in our sitting. Why? Because we need to make sure that the gravity helps us put the bow down, right? So if we sit a little bit too far back, then we use too many muscles uh, working and too much effort to create sound when um, when really just sitting properly will give you a lot of great comfort in moving the bow on the string. So that's just one example. 
Jonathan hold. Any tips to improve the agility of the left hand without tension? Uh, let's see. So coming from a Russian kind of school of cello playing, everything was based on scales. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do because you can kind of disseminate between just making good sound and moving around the notes uh, rather than making phrases. So tension from the left hand for left hand could come in in many different ways. So usually uh, people squeeze the thumb very hard. So make sure that you don't really squeeze it too much. Um, and that you can basically look for it in how you go from one finger to another, right? My teacher said that you have to be able to move your thumb a little bit, just a little bit, so to make sure that you're not squeezing it. Uh, very often the tension comes in in a form of uh, this muscle being extremely tight and usually it has to do with how hard you're um, holding the thumb. So don't, don't squeeze it too hard. I think that would be one thing that helps a lot, especially in these uh, first four positions. As you go in a thumb position, I would make sure uh, I'd, I advocate for having this straight line. So the wrist doesn't go down too much or the go doesn't go up too much. So you have a very nice energy flow going from the shoulder down through your hand into the fingertip, into the string. And I think doing scales slowly and then speeding up little by little would help a lot. Thomas Davidson, do you have any advice for expanding a cellist vibrato color palette? Uh, yeah, the vibrato is a very interesting subject. Um, I think very often we think of a lot of vibrato right away, and I would encourage everybody to start the less, in other words, to start the amplitude to be much smaller and thus having enough room to get wider. Um, I think a lot of the vibrato depends on what one does on the bow, with the bow. So the bow speed, bow pressure, and the placement of the bow on the string, whether you're on the fingerboard or coming down closer to the bridge, and how the bow moves there will affect the vibrato. So instead of just thinking about what you do with vibrato, actually start with looking at the bow, what the speed, the pressure and the placement. Those three things will influence how your vibrato sounds. Robert Hayes, how do you approach practicing large scale orchestral parts like Mahler? Yeah, Mahler, so Mahler, third symphony, you know, two hours long. Uh, Mahler, fifth symphony, 75 minutes long. And really, it's a big book. And um, a lot of it is for instance, the Fifth Symphony has probably the most extraordinary cello parts. Um, so I just practice it just like I practice sonatas or any kind of solo repertoire, little by little. You know, um, don't assume that you're going to know everything right away. But the more you practice and the more you actually play it in the orchestra, the more familiar you, be you become. One of the things I used to do as a student, which I think helped me a lot, was to actually play my part together with uh, a recording, which gives you an idea about where you're going to be, you know, what you do with a certain timing, certain uh, how fast, how slow, how, uh, articulations, especially if you have never played a piece before. I think that's a, one of the things that could give you a lot of interesting ideas and uh, also will make you familiar with what else happens in the orchestra not only going through the score and looking at it but also uh, from oral experience hearing everything else because Mahler is extremely thick you know there's 
many things happening at the same time. Hi, Jeff, from DFW Airport. Have a safe trip. I hope everything goes well. Uh, from David Sikorsky, what was working with David Sawyer? What was it like? And do you have any stories to share? Yes, I do have stories and I'll tell you what it was like. I played with David, um, with Mr. Sawyer in Marlboro. A couple of summers we actually got to play um, Schubert Cello Quintet. And you know, he kind of he always look, would look serious and had always a serious face on him, but and like to play things through over and over and over again, rather than talking about little things, he kind of just made sure that, um, you know, we get more and more familiar. And, and he enjoyed playing, uh, which was amazing, you know, with his German music experience, playing everything gazillion times, he really truly loved, loved everything. I love the music and um, he made some incredibly beautiful slides. You know, when he played things like that, when the two cello duets in the first movement, that every time would take my breath away. You know, I really, I, oh, for a moment, I would always <laughs> stop and look over because I, you know, it, it's so beautiful, whatever is happening next to me. And so uh, sensationally touching. Uh, I think it only comes from just life experience that just speaking through the instrument. And I remember once he, my bridge was extremely high because it got really humid in Marlboro and he had brought a collection of bridges. I don't know, he probably had like 15 bridges with him and he's like, come on over. And he just changed a bridge in the dining hall and somebody snapped a picture. Uh, also, another story is that people say that he, uh, one, one of the uh, things in Marlboro is people make little balls out of napkins and throw during dinners. And everybody always said, oh, he, he doesn't like it. But actually, I noticed that it wasn't true. He actually <laughs> did throw it <laughs> himself quite often. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Um, Question from Travis Louis: How did participating in the Marlboro Festival shape your musical development? Wonderful question. Uh, you know, it was probably one of the most satisfying summers. I've gone there twice in '97 and '98, and every time it was different because we worked on different pieces with different people, but. The very first summer, the very first piece I played was playing uh, Beethoven C minor trio. I think it's Opus One, number three, with Hilary Hahn, who was seventeen years old at the time, and um, Andres Schiff. And to play with him was so inspiring because everything he did made sense. And he would always explain why. And he would always do something new every time. And I remember during a dress rehearsal, uh, there's a movement that has um, variations in it. And that time he played so beautifully, I kind of just, I didn't even come in because I was so taken by it. And, you know, and then he kind of smiled back and we started playing again. And then I see somebody in the very back of the hall standing up and coming to me and to not to me to to us to say hello and it turned out to be that it was Isaac Stern that he was listening to that re rehearsal. I would probably be extremely nervous had I known that he was there, uh, but uh, having the time to spend in that festival in truly taking apart great pieces of chamber music, you know, some Beethoven quartets and Schubert quintet and Beethoven trios and Haydn quartets. Um, 
Brahms sextet. You know, not everything got to be performed, but we worked on a lot of things and having wonderful people there, great instrumentalists, some of the senior members. Uh, that's where I met Peter Wiley, who was my predecessor a few generations back as a principal of Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. And so we read or quite worked quite a bit on Scherberg or Clarkson Oft with him. And I always loved playing with him. He's just a wonderful human being and a fantastic musician and a great cellist. So that was something incredible. Hi, Stephen, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Any other questions so far? Um, you know, having all these people is truly that I met in Marlboro and um, in other festivals, including my teacher, Harvey Shapiro, I kind of thought about it during this pandemic, during this forced break, as to how lucky I am and how amazing life is to be able to meet all these people, to be able to work with my colleagues uh, and really have a constant source of inspiration uh, and also, you know, pressure to perform better for them, which I think is important because that pushes us to be better. You know, it pushes us to work harder and makes us want to play with more emotions, giving more uh, to my colleagues, but also to the audiences that come in who've been, I'm sure, extremely hungry for live classical music. You know, uh, we do a lot of Zooms uh, and there were a lot of concerts through Zooms, but I don't think anything will really um, substitute a live experience of hearing concerts live. You know, the sound, the energy just cannot be replicated over Zoom. What I love about Zoom is just that we can instantly get to any place on, on Earth that has uh, internet and be able to communicate, but still, you know, really important to have live music and live experiences, because I think it's really important for our souls. Question from John King. Could you talk about your experiences on the jury? Have you position a few positions on a jury given you interesting insight that you don't have when auditioning. Yes, absolutely. Uh, being on the other side of a screen is very eye opening. And I think it may have, I hope that may have improved my audition taking, but also in the way I teach. So I can tell you that 90, let's say 95% of people who do not pass the first round of auditions have intonation that is questionable. In other words, just play out of tune, uh, whether it's because of nerves or because of other, or because they don't pay enough attention to it. I don't know, but um, no matter where I'd be on which, in which orchestra and on what committee, that was always the case. It is so important to play in tune. You know, you're giving yourself such <laughs> a boost to just get into the next round. You know, that's probably thing number one, uh, just playing in tune and of course playing in rhythm. But, you know, I cannot emphasize strongly enough how important it is it is to play in tune, uh, to practice intonation. So I do it whenever I practice, you know, there, now there's so many different um, 
apps That's for intonation. You can be very precise. I don't know if it if it's everything that you have to do, but it's certainly those uh, apps. Uh, they'll give you an idea as to your tendencies. I'm always playing my E's too sharp, or my I'm always playing my F's too low. You know, um, really make sure that whoever's all of us who's trying to audition that the intonation is never in question because that is one thing that will always be you know the biggest stone uh all right steven honenberg who was the biggest influence in life okay well i think the biggest influence in my life are my parents uh with with their love and support and how hard they've worked all, all their life and how much they support myself and my brother. I believe they're the biggest influence, bar none. Musically, I was probably influenced most by my teacher, Juilliard Harvey Shapiro, who I've met. And from the first moments that I've heard him play, the sound that just made me, you know, think that that's exactly the type of sound that I want to get out of the cello. So he was probably the biggest influence in cellistically, you know, but also I have to say um, from the very young age, uh, Rostropovich was one of the biggest influences uh, in cello playing and probably as a person also bigger than life. And I know Stephen Newell Rostropovich very well, uh, but then several times that I met him, I was just blown away with the, his, the human side of his musicality with just as the kind of person he was, uh, the humility. I think that's one quality that I've met or I've, uh, I've seen with a many, in many great instrumentalists, how humble they are. Francis Christensen, any advice on differences in the acoustic across audition menus across the country relating to volume, clarity of articulation and note lengths, given effects of varying level of reverberation? Um, probably the the most reverberant hall I've played in was Boston Symphony Hall, where, you know, you really have to make sure that your articulation is very crystal. And um, the way I tried to figure out in the audition, you know, you sit down and you can just, you know, plug strings or make sure that you're tuning. You will hear the sound coming back and I think that's enough to tell you what happens whether you hear a lot of reverb coming back or not. I think the articulation has to be a little sharper but the articulation in the dry space has to be also very good right so don't worry too much about the difference in acoustics and uh, I think if you practice with a very good idea in mind as to what your articulations and the volume uh, and the note length that has to be precise, you know, I think that will carry on to different places and you'll be fine. All right. Uh, question from Joseph Stewart. Hi, Joan. Uh, any advice playing with piano, in particular balancing volume and the loud passages? Yes, playing with piano um, is not easy. Some, you know, some instruments can give more, some less. I think make sure that your pianist understands the the capability of your instrument. You also have to know how loud or how soft you can get or can be. Um, and so, especially in places where 
your and the piano are in the same ranges and make sure that uh, the pianist is aware of what you're doing um, because it's easier for them to be more transparent than for us to be ex much more much louder but uh, the intention of your playing has to be crystal clear um, to the audience and to your pianist so he or she or they know what you're doing and where you need them to come down to so be very clear about that all right uh Catherine Leah Ramos hi wonderful to know that you're here a uh, question from Lucas Gilmore can you discuss some suggestions on helping overcome fear and feeling nervous um yeah I think that if one is truly honest and wants to do well in the audition a concert or whatever we will always feel some nerves which i think is it is absolutely normal so um rather than thinking oh you need to relax i don't think that's the proper way of going about it we have to know what happens to to us physically and otherwise when we get nervous so usually you know we get tighter everything gets smaller we start to draw on everything in uh and obviously that's a generalization so i would think that we have to make sure that we're taller that our arms are longer that the neck never collapses that the chest becomes larger so the cello is pushed out um, and i think that um, it's okay feeling nervous so don't be don't worry and don't be fearful of feeling nerves. It gives you an extra adrenaline. It gives you an extra boost. It gives your brain an ability to work faster. It gives your vibrato some extra speed. So I actually think that it's fantastic, you know? Um, and we should try to think of it as a positive rather than a negative. Um, I also think that uh, we need to figure out what it is that we're fearful of. So if we're fearful of not hitting a shift, well, then we just need to make sure that we practice enough to, to not to miss it. And what happens when we do miss it? Is it the bow issue? Is it the left hand issue? And when you work through it, maybe little by little, the fears will go away. Uh, all right. You mentioned about Robert Holman. You mentioned trombones in another answer. Our orchestra is doing enough to guard players hearing from damage. Uh, well, I think the orchestras try to do it. And of course, the, the sound gets large sometimes, and it needs to be. And although our brass section is very careful and not to overplay, it, but sometimes it happens. And I would say that sometimes shields help uh, but sometimes you have to use some kind of protection. So whether they're earplugs or uh, just foam earplugs or specific earplugs that attenuate correctly and get the, you know, that you can still hear yourself and you don't lose the quality because that's not very uh, easy to find that kind of thing. Do you have any tips from Isaiah Sarah? Do you have any tips and or advice on improving one's sight reading, especially in an orchestral context? Thank you. Uh, you know, sight reading is important. Uh, I'm kind of <laughs> lucky because in a professional orchestra, we do have a season set up, you know, basically a year in advance. So I know what we're going to play. And ideally, we don't have to sight read. You know, we have, we can get the music far in advance to learn it but what i do or what i used to do when i was young and my parents uh, will say that's the case i would just put a whole bunch of music next to me and i would just start reading and you read and sometimes you read chamber music while listening to the recording and I, actually that is something 
that is very important to do, I think, because that makes you react very quickly as to what happens. And the more you do it, uh, the more it helps. At Juilliard, we did these exercises where we would look and then cover music bar ahead or two bars ahead or three bars ahead. And so we'd always have to read and play three bars ahead of where we were. So that also helps a lot. Robert Demain, hi, Bob. I uh, hear you're an avid golfer and excellent billiard player. <laughs> do you find that these specific disciplines are correlated to your cello playing? And do you find that chasing mastery in another pursuit enhances your cello playing? Well, you know, golf is something that cannot be mastered. So, and I think that is very similar to cello that we cannot absolutely master anything, but the pursuit of doing it. So being in a, kind of in a process, in a constant process of evaluating what you do, evaluating physical movements as as to how it relates to the sound and the expression. I think that's very important. Um, so in golf or billiards, in order to impart power or spin or speed to the golf ball, you have to hit it in a certain way. And I think cello works exactly the same way. We have to make sure that we're attacking the string correctly, that we make the sound, the pull of the string, in a correct way for the string to vibrate at at its best and and to find that to do that with least effort i think that's where my pursuit is constantly you know to find the particular way of expressing something with most simple solution i think that that is something that is difficult to find but you know and it changes throughout the years also, just like uh, learning box suites, you know, from one year to another, I can always, always find something different, something new. I hope you're well. Uh, question from Ephraim Ben. Oh, I'm sorry if I, Ezerloy. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. What is the most important thing that you learned from Rostropovich? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, I think it was about his honesty in the way he uh, gave everything at the performance. You know, he, I'd never felt that he was holding back or the performance didn't mean anything. It just seemed like every note that he played meant the world. And I think that's the most important thing. And it's not just from Rostropovich, but from the greatest uh, masters, you know, from Pablo Casals to my teacher to, uh, to uh, you know, Isaac Stern and Heifetz and all the group, Feuermann and Zara and El Sobo, that every note meant everything. So they would never go by just saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter. So that's very important. Uh, Artistic Pierre de Plessis, where you in the orchestra with, with Lopez Cobus recorded all of those Respighi tone poems? No, I was not, uh, unfortunately, but that's a fabulous recording. Uh, Carta Farad, um, could you please talk about how to practice and achieve a clear tone? So I think a clear tone, at least in the way that I understand it, is achieved by making sure that I guess you don't hear any extra noises, right? So when, for instance, people often play one string and accidentally hit something else, that does not make it more clear, probably the opposite. I would think that looking for a core of the sound, so the center of the sound is what I'm looking for, and usually the easiest way for me to find it 
is to get closer to the bridge and find a place where the bow moves without too much pressure, but it's the speed and the placement that's going to give me the most core. Okay. How was the sound experience to hear Russ Bruce play live in concert? It was remarkable. The sound was, you know, to say that the sound was large or huge is not to say anything. The sound was so full with meaning and um, it just grabs you and you cannot hear anything else here. So your entire attention is to whatever he's doing and that's how he played loud and how he, and his pianissimos were just most amazing sound I've ever heard. You know, they have so much intensity and life to it and so much meaning that, um, you know, made everybody literally just kind of move into, move in closer to hear him. But you can hear some of it on the recordings, but I think life was just even more amazing. Kevin Chen, uh, what are your thoughts on an orchestral versus chamber music career? What is the secret to maintaining such an engaging career while balancing family and stability of a lifestyle? <laughs> All right. Um, I think balance is a very difficult thing to to find the right balance is probably I don't know if I know how to do it really, but I think there's time for your career and then there's time for family and sometimes you have to give more to one and more or some other time more to another. And it, it is a balancing act. And in terms of orchestra versus chamber music career. You know, uh, when I was graduating, my teacher insisted that I would audition for an orchestra. And he said that, well, you have to belong to an institution. You have to have an address, um, which is what I think is correct. Um, whether it is chamber music or playing in the orchestra, I don't think it's that much different really because chamber music is diminutive of chamber music and the orchestra. Orchestra is just chamber music on a very large scale. Um, so, and I think to put oneself in a very particular way and say, I'm only going to do orchestra or I'm only going to do chamber music is not necessarily the best way of doing it because you don't know what's going to happen in life. So I think you can, one can only try to be the best at what we do, you know, and be the most, have an open mind and try everything. And probably throughout the years, you'll find that you like something more, you love something more. So some people love playing chamber music, uh, which is, I, I love playing chamber music. I think it's the heart of music making. But I think, I try to think of playing in the orchestra as chamber music as well because you have so many people to bounce from and, uh, you know, and to react to uh, that I think it's a fantastic way of doing it. Um, playing in the orchestra is terrific if, if you really like it, you know, but if you don't like playing chamber music and you're stuck playing a quartet, that's also very, not a very great place to be. So I think one has to figure out what one likes the most and then really try while having an open mind try to put all the effort in going after that career uh william phillips what recording would you recommend every young professional to listen to <laughs> um you know i have to say probably box suites by Pablo Casals. That's to me, that's the Bible of cello playing. Uh, I think it will, you start there and then go from the older masters to more contemporary and so on. I cannot, I could never come up with just one or several recordings because there's so many amazing recordings, but I would just start at the base of it all with Pablo Casals. And the last question to, uh, 
from Elena Midon, do you have any moments in your life that you couldn't afford to practice every day? How did you pass through it? Yes, it, it happens often. You know, uh, sometimes you're moving around or, or what, but once I practiced on the moving train, you know, went into the cargo um, compartment and practiced there. But basically, you can always look at the music or read the music and imagine what it would sound like, what you would do, what physical movements you would do with it. So I think imagination is extremely important. So don't underestimate just reading the music and trying to get better. Um, last question from Andrew Carter. How was your perspective as a musician and artist changed throughout your career? One thing that changed or actually became stronger is that my love for music and the only thing I can say without getting into specifics is that if I, as I was younger, I was thinking of playing the cello singing and now I'm starting to think of playing the cello as speaking. So thank you all very, very much. Um, you know, keep on practicing, keep on going. Uh, it's a difficult business and it's not instantaneous success that you will achieve, but a little bit of every day will get you better. Make sure you practice scales because that's a foundation of your technique and uh, you will, you know, really notice the difference of playing scales every day, even if it's not an hour, maybe even if it's 15 minutes or half an hour, every day will put you on a path of improving and being uh, going much easier around the cello or any instrument really that you play, it doesn't matter whether it's a cello or violin or piano. I think the basics are very important. And the last thing I'm going to say is that if your parents are around, if they're alive, if they if you love them, make sure they know about it. Tell them how much you love and appreciate what they've done for you.